Okay, Nathan Nugent, there's kind of a big reveal in the movie Room. Uh, there's a lot of mystery in the first half of it. You're trying to figure out where you are and what the situation is. As a film editor, yeah. how do you create that sense of mystery uh, while still staying true to what the story is eventually going to be? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, the one thing I learned with this movie was to trust two things, the story and the relationship. And if you trusted those things early on in the movie, all those would have reveals would happen within scenes to the side. And uh, certainly that, that was a, uh, a big thing for Lenny, the director, that he wouldn't ever you know, be so prescriptive to focus on, on the fact that these people are incarcerated by focusing on small things like you know, oh, you know, focusing on the door or the smallness of the space too much. You know, things like how how claustrophobic the space is is revealed very quickly through small things. Ma and Jack are doing exercise in a room, and you know, the exercise involves running from one wall to the other. You know, that's inherent in the scene. I don't, as an editor, I didn't need to do anything extra to emphasize those things. So I think the audience picks these things up. You know themselves as time goes on. A big, a big thing for us was to make the first day in room feel quite complete for the viewer. And by the end of that day, which is roughly about ten minutes of screen time, you get the sense that these people aren't going to leave, and also the predicament they're in, and the sense of threat that exists to both Ma and Jack's lives. So again, it was about trusting the story and really trusting the relationship. That was a huge, huge thing always working hard and making sure that Ma and Jack's relationship felt real, felt like it, it, had, it was genuinely five years old. Because you're joining the movie at a point where, you know, Jack says, I'm five. And, uh, you know, the movie doesn't give you any flashbacks to backstory of their existence up to that point. So there was a real responsibility on the first 10, 15, 20 minutes to feel all these things. So as an editor, it was more about, you know, not letting the editing get in the way of these reveals that kind of Lenny had set up and that Emma had set up in the story too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting also from a visual standpoint, uh, how the dimensions of the room yeah. in, the, in that first hour of the film feel much larger than they actually are. You know, it's, it's yeah. metaphorically larger. Yes. Uh, was that a discussion that, you guys had ahead of time, um, you know, ways to sort of make the room feel much larger. Yeah, it, it was um, it was addressed, but I wouldn't say it was addressed in a very uh, concerted way because, it, I mean, we had the benefit of the first, you know, I'd say about 20, 30 minutes of the movie was shot uh, consecutively. So we got a sense of the movie coming together quite quickly and how, how the sense of space was going to feel. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to say, being truthful, at no point did I ever feel that you know, the blocking or, or setups that were being used were, were repeating themselves. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing. If you felt that you were seeing the same scene or the shape of a scene was similar to one you'd seen five, 10 minutes before, <coughs> Then, you know, obviously there's a kind of, you know, visual lethargy that would start to occur in that you just feel like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm feeling claustrophobic, I'm feeling in the same place. But, you know, I've never worked on something where the smallest shift in space uh, registered as dramatically as it did. And again, that's down to lighting decisions that Danny Cohen, the DOP, would have made. Lens choices were a huge, huge issue. And quite often, a lot of what happens in room is in close-up. So, it, you know, obviously our point of interest is foreground, but the background is, is always changing in subtle ways in that you're picking up lift, different details of the wall and so on and so forth. But, I mean, for me, the big thing about how close and intense uh, it feels in room through the use of close-ups is really... Um, for me, that reflects the closeness of the relationship rather than the tightness of the space. So again, going back to that point, there's always real focus, uh, and Lenny would always talk about it throughout shooting, was, you know, how's the relationship forming? How is that playing? So we would te we tend to try not to get too caught up in, you know, visual trickery 
or getting bogged down in a conversation about space and so on. Because these are conversations you can have, and they're nice ones to have, but really an audience isn't going to be engaged about what the dimensions of a room are. They're going to be engaged by what the characters are doing and the predicament they're in. Right, totally. Let's, let's talk a bit about the pacing of the film. It's about a yeah. two-hour movie, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And my, my watch, uh, you know, when I saw the film, it, it's about an hour into the movie when it takes yeah. a dramatic shift. Was that yes. something that was always a part of the plan? or? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, script-wise, that's pretty much, you know, where that, that event occurs. Now, Lenny, as a director, would always leave things open. You know, he, he would have been open to the idea that, you know, maybe there's a cut of this movie where that point happens three quarters of the way into the movie or even a third of the way into the movie. Like, so, you know, the script was really well written and it had certain goal, you know, goalposts that we wanted to get to throughout it. But, but our gut feeling was that that would occur approximately halfway through the movie. And I remember Lenny saying, like, you know, roughly saying, oh, I think it might happen around minute, you know, X. And he was pretty much spot on by the time we got to the final cut. So, yeah, it was always, you know, it's certainly in Lenny's mind. I mean, I, I was pretty much on the same path as him. I, I think, you know, I felt that that was going to occur halfway through the movie, but I couldn't put a minute on it. But, yeah, we always knew that actually... It would be wrong to to get in the way of where the story was heading, you know. Wrong to kind of build extra beats within the first half just to delay that moment, because you know there was a different story to tell in the second half of the movie and a different exploration. We might as well get there and see what happens, you know. So, yeah, some people describe it as a movie of uh, two movies kind of back to back that kind of run directly into each other. I mean, I'm not sure about that because I think where Jack's voiceover falls in the movie, uh, kind of, you know, which is kind of really five different occasions. For me, they're the, the, the key points in the film that tie both part two and part one together, if you, if, you, if you know what I mean. So yeah, pacing, we're always conscious of it, but we always knew that the second half of the movie would be a different shape and a different tone and a different mood. It had different requirements, you know, it had slightly different story to tell because the challenge was being reset for this relationship and for this couple. Right, yeah, that's something I was gonna bring up because I mean, it does feel like two separate stories. Yeah. But of course you also have to make them feel like they're of the same story and mm -hmm. of a cohesive whole. So, you know, uh, stylistically, um, you know, how do you make them feel like they're in the same exact film? You know? Yeah, like, <clears throat> I mean, there was an interesting thing that occurred to me the other day watching the DVD commentary. And when we were doing the DVD commentary, there was myself and Lenny and Danny Cohen, the DOP, and the production designer, Ethan Tobin. And what I found was, you know, there's a very particular visual style in Room. Obviously, it's a lot closer and it's a lot more direct. And you'll notice in the second half of the movie, you know, there's a bit more of an exploration of space through wide shots and, and uh, you know, they're in Grandma's house and it's, you know, there's lots of frames within frames in, in, in the second half of the movie. I mean, that's inherent in the frame. There's nothing I had to do to kind of emphasize that. But what's interesting about that is the sense of space is used to show a distance growing between Ma and Jack. And it's not just about their physical location. And then there's a scene towards the end of the movie where they reconcile and you're back in direct large close-ups, which is a direct reflection of room. And also there was another technique that we knew it was a very simple one we knew we were going to flash back visually to room or see room one more time in the second half mm -hmm. but we weren't absolutely sure when we wanted to do that but i think we picked the right moment and it occurs maybe just after maybe three quarters of the way through the movie and uh, i think it it's used probably you know at its most emotionally significant point so again little techniques like that were very effective to tie it all together, those two kind of living parts of the film, if you like. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about working with uh, Lenny Abramson? You were yeah. previously on Frank, which is a totally different kind of movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's that collaboration like? 
it's it's wonderfully open and very giving and Lenny is extremely patient I mean the, the wonderful thing about working with Lenny is and I mean this in the best possible way in any situation he is the smartest guy in the room uh, and he's he's the smartest guy in the room uh, in a, such a way that there's no ego involved there there's no sense of needing to emphasize this point but he's someone who's both you know deeply intelligent deeply philosophical and just incredibly creative but also open to other ideas and open to exploring other ideas so we've worked on three movies together and each time has been an incredible learning experience for me uh, and you know as i said before we'll talk before a movie starts to shoot but not in in uh, usually more about story issues not about you know technical things and they're just thoughts and that process of that conversation continues all the way through the shoot and all the way through the edit and we work really really closely uh, and yeah just a really wonderfully kind creative uh, giving director and uh, i feel very lucky to have had a relationship that has lasted over three movies with lenny mm -hmm. i want to talk a bit about the ending not to give it away yes um, of course yeah it's a very powerful ending, and yeah. it's the kind of thing that really has to be earned, you know. Yes, yes. So can you talk about as an editor, you know, making sure that that kind of ending is earned by, you know, what precedes it? You know, is it difficult? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Like, we had that ending. It was shot maybe two weeks before the end of the shoot. So it existed as a kind of isolated thing in my timeline, if you like. Mm -hmm. And you know, pretty much the first first cut of that ending is as is in the movie now. It, it didn't change one bit, which is really rare because quite often you'll retweak a scene based on what you know the scene that goes before it, or even the scene that goes before that, based on the emotional trajectory, if you like. Mm -hmm. But actually, that scene was just so brilliantly uh, directed and shot and the emotional pitch of it was so spot on like the first cut just worked and we just never changed it then I mean we obviously changed music and, and things like that but we didn't shift the cuts at all it just you know the performances were so so good that it, that it worked really well so I'd like to say that you know okay we really worked it into the ground and you know we, we cut it many many times but actually it was just one of those scenes that just was a really just you know, it inherited all its emotional power from the journey up to that point. Mm -hmm. So you had to do very little to it, you know. Um, and that was the success, you know, through the judging process was protecting the emotional journey, protect, pr protecting the relationship between Ma and Jack. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, you're obviously conscious and you're always open to change. You know, your first cut's going to be, first cut of this movie was maybe three hours plus. Uh, so you know we lost a lot on the way, but but a scene like that just never really changed. So you know it's always just being conscious about something you've you know you'll change something that happens thirty minutes before that, and just you'll you need to chart what the ripple effect is. Uh, but that didn't happen with that ending. It was just kind of a thing unto itself, and it just always worked. Mm -hmm. I think it really has to do with that last shot too. Again, I don't want to give anything away, but I mean. It's <laughs> It's so great because there's this sense of confinement throughout the film, and all of a sudden it's just big, wide open. You know what I mean? Um, and exactly, and and you know, again, not giving anything away, but seeing people that you've physically or emotionally been that close to for two hours, seeing them kind of walk into walk away into the well, it's not a sunset, um, yeah. walk away into the distance is. Uh, is quite something actually. It's you feel you feel sad to what, let them go, but happy that in the knowledge that they're going, they're moving ahead with things. You know, they can finally move forward now after everything that they've gone through. Right. Lastly, I just want to ask you um, what your, I guess, philosophy, as it were. Uh, yeah. What makes good editing for you? What makes good editing? Um, for me, it's actually, you know, it's often talked about by editors, you know, needing to stay in the background. And it's a philosophy I would agree with uh, about making editing invisible. Um, 
I mean, the big thing for me is, but is always protecting story. And sometimes you've got to make difficult technical decisions and difficult grammatical decisions as an editor. You know, sometimes you'll have to go a kind of a, a route that you didn't expect to go. But but I think story and character are paramount for me personally. It's not about making an impression, you know, visually as an editor, or you know, it's it's about trying to find a cohesive whole to any piece of, any piece of storytelling. And also, it's really important to honestly reflect a director's voice and a director's vision. And that's something I really try to do. And it's not through a lot of conversation with a director. It's actually just by really sensing through what they've shot and how they're shooting and why they're shooting it that way, reflecting that voice in as honest a way as possible. So, I mean, that would be a big, big deal for me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations on the film. Thank you, Zach. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you, too. Thank you. Bye.